Welcome to The Long Road. My name is Chris Roberts. Um, I hope you enjoyed last week's um, Wings of Freedom with some of our local veterans who flew and um, took part of World War II. We're going to continue that a little bit this week um, as a Veterans Day. As some of the people that know me, I try to keep Veterans Day as non-political as possible. I think politics get us into too many wars, so on Veterans Day we, sh we don't need to talk about um, politics. I'm going to have two um, short video clips after I get done speaking here. These two clips were I showed last year. One was um, a female um, veteran who served in the Marine Corps during um, World War II and got out as, as a corporal. The, I was hoping to find some other um, women veterans, but unfortunately we don't have too many women veterans left from World War II, so we don't get to learn the importance of their role in World War II. So if anybody knows a World War II veteran that would like to be interviewed and for posterity and to gain their knowledge, feel free to contact me. The second part is a scaled down clip from um, an, <clears throat> excuse me, a Navy fighter pilot during, who served in the South Pacific on the USS Enterprise. I think you'll enjoy um, both of those clips. Veterans Day. It's going to be kind of weird this year. I know some people are going to highlight the the 11th second of the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of the 11th year. There's no doubt in my mind there'll be people out, out there taking, be able to take advantage of the day, trying to make as much political hay or as much advertising benefit out of honoring veterans. When you watch TV, you read articles, you know which ones are doing it out of the goodness of their heart and which ones are just doing it to gain political points or to earn money. Me, I spent, as we go, 21 years, two months, and 26 days on active duty in the Marine Corps, a total of a little bit more than 25 years between active duty and reserve time. We Marines were kind of egotistic. We, we really don't treat ourselves as um, veterans. We like to say we're Marines from the moment we get commissioned or the moment we graduate out of boot camp until the moment we're put in the grave. So... <clears throat> I go back and forth, go back and forth looking at what is a veteran, what does a veteran deserve or earn. The, I got a quote from Teddy Roosevelt, a man who is good enough to shed his blood for his country is good enough to be given a square deal afterward. <clears throat> More than no man is entitled and less than no man shall have. Teddy Roosevelt, July 4th, 1903. Teddy Roosevelt, the only person to win the Nobel Peace Prize and earn the Medal of Honor. President of the United States. <clears throat> I think he got it right on. And the more I talk to World War II veterans, they're proud of their service, but they don't ask for anything special. And I think that's important. They stood up, both men and women. They did their job just like the ones who went to Korea, the ones who went to Vietnam, the ones who are now serving in Iraq and Afghanistan, and the ones that served in all those minor conflicts like Grenada, um, Panama, Beirut, Libya. They're all, they all stood up. I think very few of them joined the military for glory. They joined it because they felt it was the right thing to do. They may have joined it for college, but in the end, the great majority of them came out better people, and if they had to do it again, they would do it all over again. But my biggest concern right now is that veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan have the highest unemployment rate in the history of any conflict. And I don't see how it's going to get any better. And so when we talk about honoring veterans, it's more than... November 11th. Colin Powell in Parade Magazine this weekend says Veterans Day has to be 365 days a year. 
We just don't show up on November 11th and say, we honor our veterans and then go home. Because a lot of our veterans have come back, they've been broken, <clears throat> they've suffered mental illness, they've suffered physical wounds, they suffered psychological wounds, and they need to be helped. They don't need to be pitied, they don't need to be looked down upon, they need to be able to get help, and we need to help them so they can maintain their dignity. And people will go, oh no, I really support veterans. Well, you may support veterans, but you'll be surprised what happens <clears throat> when you, the, the look on your face. If I go and tell people that I'm 90% disabled because I've had 16 medical procedures as a result of military services, they give me that look. It's kind of like, you know what? You don't look disabled. Why, why aren't you out working? Why, ain't, why are you sucking off my taxes? But if I go and tell them I'm a retired Marine Corps colonel, they'll go and say, hey, we can't give you enough. You earned it. You deserve more than what your country is giving you. But wait a minute, I'm the same person. I, I am no different than the other veterans that have gone off to war, got injured, or the ones who had service-connected disabilities. They're the same person. So when they go and say, I'm a disabled vet, <clears throat> make sure, be conscious of the reaction or those nonverbal signs you go, because those veterans can pick it up, and they can see like you're it comes across sometimes as quite condescending, and we can't afford to be condescending. And so, like I said with um, Teddy Roosevelt's quote, a man who is good enough to shed his blood for his country is good enough to be given a square deal afterward. More than that, no man is entitled and <clears throat> any less than any man shall have. A veteran is an American, just like everyone else. They stood up. They served their time. Some served their time in the United States. Others served their time in the combat zone. But they served their time. They don't want to be treated special, but they want to be treated fairly. So the best thing that we can do for veterans is treat them fairly 365 years ago. We don't put them on a pedestal so we can knock them down, and we don't pity them. Let's treat all our veterans, both men and women, especially women. One of the sad parts about Iraq-Afghanistan war, over 100 women have either been killed in action or died as a result of service in the combat zone. Never in the history of the United States has that ever happened. <clears throat> I think in Vietnam, I'm not really sure, but I think about seven or eight nurses got killed in Vietnam. American women who are not, <clears throat> by law, don't serve in combat units. The front line is fluid. IEDs are everywhere. And American women, service women, are dying, and they're coming back with limbs. And so, again, we need to treat all our veterans, male and female, with dignity and as equals. And so, again... On Veterans Day, just say thank you. So we will go to the videos now, and I hope you enjoy. Hello, my name is Chris Roberts. I want to welcome everyone to our special um, show on um, veterans of Cheshire County. We're here to take an oral history of a lot of our veterans, World War II, um, Korean War, and early Vietnam War veterans, members of Cheshire County um, who went into the service. Many made the choice to go into the service, some were drafted, but they all made an impact, and it all changed their life. This is in honor of Veterans Day, and we will have two episodes, one to run all this week and one to run um, next week. So I hope everyone enjoys this, how people use this to reflect back and look at the contributions these men and women um, have contributed to our great country. And so our first guest will be... Anne Panetta. But I, 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 I was in Massachusetts at the time. I, That's all right. So <laughs> You're here now. <laughs> I'm up here now. We retired up here. 
my husband and I. He was in the Navy. So we, we, we used to have words over that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so you, what branch of the service were you in? I, I, was, a, I, I was a Marine, in, in the, uh, my uh, rank was corporal. I, I, that's as far as I went. And, uh, it, when did uh, you join the Marine Corps? Uh, 1942. And uh, I, was, I was there just short of three years. I was, uh, I was glad to come home. <laughs> The, um, since women were never drafted, no. what, what made you make up your mind that you'd want to become a Marine? I, uh, I used to look at all those posters. Uncle Sam wants you. <laughs> 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 I remember those posters? And so I, I said, well, as a lock, my, my girlfriend and I were, were going to join. Well, she backed out. <laughs> I went through all that, all that physical and, and mental and everything else. And uh, so she said, oh, no, I, I, I guess I'm not going to bother. So I, 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 was there, I was there. So uh, it was uh, an experience. Yeah, because most women go after the Marines because they look co pretty cool and pretty sharp and they dress blues. <laughs> most don't join the Marine Corps to get near Marines. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the Marines and ego went together. <laughs> uh, we don't have ego. <laughs> and um, I think one of the strange people, one of the things that most people don't understand, Marines, when um, the Commandant was asked, because all the other services, the Army, the Waves, the WAX, all those, and I was, in Marine Corps history, it's like, what are we going to call women Marines? What are we going to call women Marines? We've got to come up with some name. And he goes, darn it. A Marine's a Marine, yeah. we'll call them Marines. A woman, a woman a Marine, yes, that was it. So uh, it, uh, there was no other, no other nomenclature. No, no, culture. a Marine's a Marine. So where, where were you stationed in the United States? Uh, I was permanent personnel at Camp Resume. And uh, I never did get to Camp Pendleton as I wanted to, but... Uh, you wanted to hang out I, with the I Hollywood worked, guys. I worked in the uh, quartermaster office. And uh, we, I relieved a, a Marine for active duty. So that's, that was the, the reason for the women Marines, so that the, the men could go to the, uh, do the, do the duty overseas. Because the Marine, women Marines never went overseas. We went as far as Pearl Harbor. And that was, that was the extent of travel. Can I remember those posters, join Marine Corps, send a man overseas, send a Marine overseas? Yes. I don't know if they always liked it, but. <clears throat> so at Camp Lejeune, you spent about three years at Camp Lejeune, quartermaster, so that's basically supply. Supply. And so yeah. you, you saw a lot of, a lot was, of people yeah, going through. Yeah, it was, a, it was a beautiful camp, but it was set in, in, the, in the wilderness <laughs> of North Carolina. <laughs> uh, to, uh, we, we used to have a 48-hour pass, and we'd go up to Raleigh. That was uh, uh, Liberty Town. That's the, the <laughs> capital of North Carolina. So uh, it was, uh, as I said, an experience. I didn't think I'd be, a after a few months, I didn't think I'd be homesick, but I, I, I really was. I got over that, but uh, <laughs> that was. Uh, but in, um, <clears throat> I spent plenty of time in Camp Lejeune it can be quite brutally hot and humid in yeah. the summer. Yeah. You've got nice beaches, but it's quite different than Massachusetts. Yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it was, it was a nice camp. I remember that uh, Olympic-sized pool that uh, whenever, I, whenever I could, I, I, uh, I took advantage of, uh, of swimming because I love to swim. So uh, it, was, uh, it was really a very nice camp. Did you ever get to visit some of the great cities like Charleston or Savannah? Or you were just stuck at Camp Virginia? Um, well, it was mostly uh, uh, Raleigh. Um, uh, there wasn't much, there really wasn't much in North Carolina. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, Camp Lejeune is still big and it still isn't much in North Carolina. No. <laughs> so I want to thank you for coming. Thank and you. I enjoy your service. Yes. I thank your service. Thank and you. I, I thank you for standing up and making a choice. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Simplify. Simplify. I want to welcome our, our next guest um, all the way from Dublin, New Hampshire, in this bad, crappy weather day. Yeah. Well, we had a lot of 
ice on the road and getting in and out of the car. Pretty exciting. <laughs> Temperature of 30 degrees, 32 degrees. You were, um, what, what type of plane did you fly during World War II? F4, F4F, F, which was a small fighter. And let me tell you, I'm very happy to have my feet like this instead of having my knees up around my chin. And I'm. So did, um, <clears throat> did you fly off carriers or? Yes. All, all the way carrier based. Um, what were some of the carriers that you flew on? Well, I spent the majority of my time on the Enterprise, which was the big character, the biggest, the most decorated ship in the Navy. And uh, I flew the F4F, which is not designed for somebody who's six foot two <laughs> inches tall. Because the cockpit is very small and your legs are up like this. And they, you find that it's very difficult when you take off on a long flight you have an extra gas tank down below, which will take you 100 miles or so. And you always got rid of that. The minute you thought you were going to be shot at by anybody, you wanted to get rid of that damn tank. Reduce the drag, give you some more speed. Excuse me? To, to reduce the drag and give you more speed in the dog Yeah, plate. yeah. <clears throat> and that was the only part of flying that I disliked because I had a couple of bad knees and uh, was known as the flying knee because of the fact <clears throat> that I was kind of gimpy. And, uh... Did you, um... When did you join, join the Navy? Well, I was in a... I try to figure out what day it was or what it was. It was Nineteen forty-two or so, and I stayed in the Navy in the Air Corps. Heard it, and I love it. I said, "Well, I like it too," because you know when you look the guy in the mirror. And you, he'd say, well, we'll do some inverted stuff, Peter. How's it sound? I'd say, it sounds good to me. Because I wanted to see what he was going to do. So, believe it or not, he taught me to do a snap roll. Have you ever heard of a snap yep. roll? Well, normal, you're sitting like this in the cockpit. And to do a snap roll... You slow the plane down a little bit and pull the stick back like so and kick your right rudder and the plane goes up into a, what would be a spin almost yeah. and turns around and that's an in, a snap roll and an inverted snap roll is something I haven't found anybody else done it except me, is that you're flying inverted like so, and 
instead of you pull the stick back suddenly and kick right rudder and the plane will go right around and your stomach goes into your face. <laughs> you don't know whether you're going to throw up or not, but it was it's really the most difficult thing you can do in the airplane because it can put you into a spin for one thing. You got to be prepared for anything that uh, happens. But believe me, it was something that you knew how to do after that. I never wa went up and flew the plane and did an inverted snap roll <clears throat> because I didn't feel that it was necessary in my life. You didn't, you didn't have G-suits back then like the guys No, had. hell no. <laughs> you just had a... Vomit bag? A normal covering. <laughs> But anyhow, that's how I became a fighter pilot. And I figure, by golly, I know what the hell's going on up there at 10,000 feet. I know how to do things. And it was valuable information that you'd circulate in your mind. So. <clears throat> You spent time during World War II. You yeah. spent time on the Enterprise. Yeah. We couldn't have won the war in the Pacific without the Enterprise. And ships, That's right. And especially the squadrons on the, the Enterprise. Yeah. They yeah. did a tremendous job. You're 92 years old. Yeah. And I see that you're only one of the 50% of the registered voters in New Hampshire that went to the polls <laughs> last Tuesday. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Where was it? It stuck on me. <laughs> yeah, it says right here. I <laughs> voted. New Hampshire voted. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but that's important. And I think a lot of people like you, the ones who spent time in Korea, Vietnam, World War II, yeah. they go and say, you know what? We're doing this. We're doing it so other people can have this right. Yeah. But we understand we go out and vote. A lot of the people who have got the right to vote as a result of what a lot of veterans have done yeah. and a lot of other ones have given their life for, take it for granted. Just don't go out and vote. Yeah, I don't know why not. I've been a uh, Republican since my father died, and he was a staunch Republican and voted for Al Smith. That's a long time ago. Long Al Smith, time governor ago. of New York, 1932, yeah. Yeah, 1932, you're right. <laughs> Jeez. You know a hell of a lot more than I do. <laughs> Well, I'm a Marine, we're supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> but well, um, <clears throat> I want to thank you for your time. Oh, well, you're welcome. I really enjoyed it. And I want well, to thank good. you for your service. Good. And um, you got that smile. Well, 92, you. you got that smile. Thank you, too. You, I you got a good grip, too. Welcome back. The <clears throat> When I stand in awe of these World War II veterans and some of the Korean War veterans, but especially the World, World War II veterans, I feel humble. And all wars are different. All people have to serve their time in hell. You can't go and say, because I served in World War II, my war was different than the war in Vietnam or the war in Korea or the war in the Persian Gulf. You can go to their family and say, well, it's different. Well. If you get killed or you lose a limb, it's no different whether it happened in the Civil War, Revolutionary War, World War II, or in Iraq. And so, like I said, there's just something about some of the people I've interviewed. They have all left me in awe. And sometimes I go to myself and I say, how could I measure up to them? And they'll tell me, nope, you did what you needed to do. You answered the call when the call was given. So again, we don't have too many World War II veterans left. They're passing on to the final muster at a rapid rate. So if your grandparents or your great-grandparents served in World War II, maybe time to sit down and get to understand what they went through.
So <clears throat> now on to a little lighter note or maybe whiter note. I'm going to finish up with some actual footage of our little northeasterner, or as I call the Halloween northeasterner, which dumped about 18 inches of snow in the Keene area. We're all lucky it's all gone right now. And so, again, just um, enjoy some of the footage if you were the lucky ones and you didn't go out. And so, I'll say is goodbye. I'll see you on the long road. And hopefully you enjoy our little holiday whiteness. So, thank you. October 29th, 415 Wheelock Park. The first snowstorm of the season. Just earlier today, people were out pick, raking up leaves, getting ready to get rid of the fall leaves. We were a chance of a um, little bit of rain today around 3, 4 o'clock, turning into snow later on tonight. <clears throat> As we can see right now, the snow isn't waiting till tonight. The snow is just coming down pretty heavy at Robin Hood Park. Needless to say, there could be a few unhappy kids come Monday. It's coming down pretty heavy. So, by the time this airs on the show, we will be able to find out if the storm was bigger than the four to eight inches they were calling for. Maybe it coming early and finishing early. We just don't know yet. But, we're just going to have to see. Nothing like an October Northeasterner. <coughs> I don't know, snow's getting heavier. It's almost like it's getting pretty close. Could be whiteout conditions. And like I said, it's not even five o'clock yet. Oh, come on. It's cold. <clears throat> Snow is packing up pretty quickly. This could have a pretty negative effect on a lot of the, the city and the town's budgets. <clears throat> no one was expecting um, snow this early, let alone the size of this storm, the way it looks. <clears throat> Even when you look at the amount of snow, I've only been here for maybe three to four minutes. It's coming down heavy. When you go in and you look, the snow's wet. Like it says, it's coming down heavy. If the wind picks up, it could really turn into blizzard conditions. When you look at the um, snow, it's almost coming probably coming at about a 60 degree angle. The wind is picking up. Look at the, um, the snow that's on the leaves, on the tree limbs. They're already drooping. And this, it's only been snowing for maybe about 15, 20 minutes total. So if the wind picks up, which is supposed to, 10 to 20 miles an hour would gust up to 50, there's a good chance that um, a lot of people are gonna lose power tonight. Pretty, but it could be awful dangerous. <clears throat> I 
watching it. Snow just piling up here on the camera. Would not be surprised to see a lot of kids out here tomorrow morning sliding down the hill, taking advantage of the snow. <clears throat> well, a couple of good things. Good thing it doesn't happen Sunday. Otherwise, we would have a snow day on Halloween. Can I... But that'd be a good one. I would never picture or even think of a possibility of a snow day on Halloween. I bet you that would drive the moms and dads crazy. Kids all day trying to ask, is it time to go out yet? Is it time to go out yet? Oh, it's really picking out. I can feel the wind. It's almost going sideways. <clears throat> yep, it's getting almost white out conditions. Hopefully people are um, being safe and not driving around and being stupid. Boy, I bet your Ruth Sterling and Shine On and a lot of other people are extremely happy that the Pumpkin Fest wasn't today. This would, if Pumpkin Fest was today, this would be a total disaster. <clears throat> the nonprofits would lose their quarter of a million dollars that they get from the Pumpkin Fest. Businesses would lose. And a lot of people would have product that would have gone to, to waste. So. Yeah. It's getting pretty nasty out here. It's pretty slushy. Dangerous part is it's about 33, 34 degrees right now. <clears throat> Once the sun goes in, this could very easily freeze and then get covered up with four or five inches of snow. For some people, this is white gold. There'll be people out there plowing tonight and plowing tomorrow. For them, they'll make a happy Thanksgiving and have more money in their pocket for Christmas. So, <clears throat> so this is what it's like at Robin Hood Park. Like I said, almost completely white out conditions. Center of Keene, about five o'clock, came flying down the hill from Robin Hood Park, slippery, almost went into someone's front porch. Still busy, snow piling up, getting slippery. How's it going? Not like a little bit of snow, huh? <laughs> snow and Halloween, what can you ask for? <clears throat> yeah. Probably Saturday night when the sun goes down. I think a lot of people are going to stay home tonight. How's it going? Hey, hey. You're going to get some nice pictures. Yeah, having fun in the snow? <laughs> One of the questions a lot of people had about downtown Keene, what was going to happen when the weather got cold. City truck going by, throwing some salt, keeping traffic flowing. What was going to happen to everybody in downtown Keene 
the center of team. Well, right now, there was five. Looks like two are getting ready to, to leave. A little bit of snowball fighting. So the question is, how long are you going to be willing to uh, stay? Oh, man. Not much. It's a beautiful shot. Yeah. What are you filming? Huh? What are you, what are you filming? Just filming downtown, the first snowstorm of the year. Yeah. 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 The Halloween, the Halloween oh, snowstorm. I know, before Halloween. <laughs> Around here? Yeah, I live right down the street. Oh, no, doubt. no one would believe that um, it was snowing. You might get about four to eight inches tonight, too. Oh, awesome. uh, it said, uh, like, three, uh, I thought it said, like, eight to twelve. It might be the way, because it wasn't supposed to start snowing until about five or six. It was supposed to have a little bit of rain. Yeah. But I think someone forgot to tell them about the rain. Probably. <laughs> yeah. Have a good evening. Don't freeze. <laughs> So, not troublemakers, just like any teenage kids. What we all did as kids, a few little snowballs. We got away with throwing them at cars, but you know, you can't do it nowadays. You find yourself in court. But, Traffic's still going. The Keene Historic Landmark. The church at the center of Keene. I guess I was a little wrong. The clock says... Six minutes of five. You can't think of Keen without the, the church at the center, right near the commons. <clears throat> they put a grant in recently <clears throat> with the city council endorsed, trying to get some money to repair the steeple. If they can't get any money, it's hard to say what's going to happen. But I just couldn't picture Keen coming down, coming up Main Street and Keen toward City Hall and not be able to see the church. You know, it's an icon. And I don't think we want to see the icon move, disappear. It's on the historic register, but doesn't matter if it's on the historical register, it still needs money to stay up for repairs. Just really a strange sight. Seeing the foliage cover the foliage colors covered with a nice wet snow. Down here at the Ashwilla Dam, just drove by People's Bank, the thermometer, temperatures reading 30 degrees, I sure missed the old other landmark that was here in Keene when I first came here at Keene to go to college, it was old, the Keene Cooperative Bank, the clock and temperature reading 
downtown. But like many of the old small businesses gobbled up by the big banks. I think it must have been gobbled up three or four, maybe five different times. <clears throat> maybe we wouldn't be in such a bad financial decision if we still had small bankers making decisions or maybe having cooperative banks where the owners are you and your fellow members and you make loans and decisions based on the trustworthiness of your neighbor plus there's just another thing about it when you're borrowing your neighbor's money or your co-worker's money you're more apt to pay it back because you don't want to look your friend or neighbor in the eye and say nope I'm not paying it back but on the other hand you may not have all perfect credit but you know what you have personal integrity and your friends know somehow some way if you lo they loan you money, you'll pay them back. That seems pretty good to me. Here it is. I'm in the Alma Lansing parking lot. All by myself. Well, with you guys, with the audience now. Just hearing the sound of the dam. The dam that's at could be at risk. The question is, some people say, tear it out. Let the fish come up the Connecticut River like it used to be. But one of the problem is they can only go so far up because you get the big dam up there, about four or five miles up the road, I think Surrey Dam. Other people say, you know, we can cut bracks some on the side, cut out some of these invasive trees, <clears throat> and find a way for the water to, you know, go around so we don't have a risk of the dam rupturing. But even if the dam failed, it would cause little to no damage. But again, it's a keen icon. One of the reasons the dam's here was for the colony mills. Another mill that employed hundreds and again helped to find Keene, put Keene on the map as a manufacturing area. So, whether the dam stays or the dam goes, it's going to take community involvement. The community needs to make a decision. But if the dam goes, there's no going back. I guess one of the questions we'll have in the future, I think the last proposal, it may cost us ten to $12,000 after, if the dam stays and we fix it, ten to 12,000 bucks a year to maintain the dam. I think that's well worth it. The people that come here to get married, the people that come here during the summer to sit by, sit by the dam, read a book, the parents and their kids, the grandparents and their kids that come and sit, watch the dam, watch the birds. I think some blue herons and some other type of herons fish on the side. And it just makes Ashwillet Park what a place to relax at Ashwillet Park and watch the dam. So it's up to the people of Keene to get involved to decide whether 
we keep the dam or the dam goes? That's one of the questions. Do we want the people of, up at the state of New Hampshire say we don't want the dam, take it out? Do we want people from out of state, out of um, definitely not from Keene, who says tear the dam and let the fish come? But the other question is, I problem that concern is, if I remember correctly, I've heard people say you have an endangered species, some kind of a, a mussel that's up here. So there's a lot of decisions to be made. And again, it involves the people of Keene getting involved. If you don't get involved, whatever decision happens, it's done and over with. It's almost like a Norman Rockwell moment. Downtown, or winter downtown, in a New England town. The only problem is, is October. What's that? Yeah. The Colonials. Brew Baker. People on their bike. There it is out of T front of TD North Bank. Used to be King Cooperative Bank. Used to have the sign. There it is, Keen Cooperative, the time and the weather. I remember the lowest it ever got was 34 below. But just a nice place to walk. Nice winter day. But still, can't get over. It's not even Halloween yet. It's about 8.30. Looks like we've had about six to eight inches of snow already. I hope it doesn't go to two, four o'clock tomorrow. Because if not, if so, we're going to get more than eight inches of snow. Saturday night, 15. Central Square. You know what? I never understood why they call it Central Square. It's commons and it has nothing square about it. At the gazebo, not a single person at the gazebo. No noise, no nothing. Not a single person protesting. I guess a little bit of cold and snow. snow changes gives people a different idea of what they want to do. Well, we'll just have to see tomorrow when the weather's supposed to get better. Okay. It's a little bit before nine o'clock. Most of the stores in downtown Keene is closed. The kitchen store. Pocket full of rye, ingenuity. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, this one diffuse store. Really, the only Armadillo's closed, Michelle's closed. Really. But fat stuff is open. Um, Amici's getting ready to close, don't have too much business. No King's Garden doesn't have much business.
Colonial. Nice sight. <clears throat> kind of a little old nostalgic view. Again. It's kind of amazing how much a, a week can change everything. Last Friday, a lot of not the town Potakin towards Central Square was quite deserted. Patrons at cobblestones were spilling out to the street. And you went by Lag and Lager. You couldn't even walk onto the sidewalk because there were so many people. And the part is most of them were just plain old rude and wouldn't step out of the way. It really amazes me what smokers will do just to have a cigarette. There it is. Two people just standing out in the snow, freezing weather, windy, just so they can suck on a cigarette. So, I guess it makes the state of New Hampshire happy with the cigarette tax. Yep, at the roundabout. It's amazing. People will stand out in the freezing cold just to have a cigarette. But really, it's no different for people. I've seen a person on a bike, other people just going out to get their 12 pack of beer. Well, at least it's good that they're walking. And if they get wasted, I guess it's best to get wasted in their own room or own home. So not to endanger anybody else. I'm just saying this. Back is... Tried to figure what was going to happen since Marlboro Street hasn't been finished. And as anybody who's been driving up and down Marlboro Street knows, as they try to avoid the elevated manhole covers. Not like Winchester Street. It's already been done, finished, crosswalk, yield signs. Striping has already been done. It's been a long time for Marlboro, and we're still waiting for it to get finished. I guess it's not going to be finished this Monday. <laughs>